Hello. So in this video, we're talking about Yanis Glowacki's play Antigone in New York. Now, uh, if I pronounced uh, Yanis Glowacki's name wrong, I apologize. Uh, I He's Polish, and Polish is one of those languages where a lot of times things are pronounced quite differently than they appear to be spelled. Uh, I did try to find uh, a YouTube video where, where his name would be pronounced by someone, but most of the YouTube videos I was able to find about him are in Polish. Uh, so I didn't watch them because I don't speak Polish. And if I spoke Polish, I'd probably know how to pronounce his name, so problem solved. Anyway, we're going to talk about his play Antigone in New York, which is a very, very loose um, adaptation of Antigone. And it's really, it's an interesting approach to adapting the Antigone story because it's really not thematically very similar to Sophocles' Antigone. Um, there's very little sort of overt resistance to injustice in this play. That's really just, it, it, it's not a central focus here. Instead, what the focus seems primarily to be in this play is the question of fitting in to the United States, or what it means to, to be an American, or to fit in America. Um, because we have five characters, one of whom is dead. Polly is dead. Um, so we just see his body. Uh, we never actually hear from him. The policeman is an American. He was born in the U.S. Uh, not Native American, just his family. He, he's not a he's not a an immigrant, first generation, second generation, something like that. Um, but then the other three characters who who get the majority of the stage time, Sasha, Anita, and Flea, they're all immigrants. They're also all homeless. And so that's another sort of component here. Um, we have the, the angle of what it means to be an immigrant in America. We also have the angle of social class or economic status. So uh, Sasha is a Russian Jew. Uh, Anita is a Puerto Rican. And Flea is a Polish Catholic. Uh, and they're all homeless. They all hang out together in uh, in the park. Okay. So the theme of belonging in America actually begins right from the very opening of the play. Um, act one, scene one, we have the policeman uh, who comes on stage. And he's our first sort of introduction to the themes of the play, both homelessness and uh, immigration as factors involved in, in assessing whether or not someone belongs. So uh, the policeman comes on and he says, I just want to say from the beginning that I have nothing against the homeless. They're the same as you and me, except they don't have homes. Don't let anyone kid you. There's some cultured people out there and a lot of them are highly educated. The fact is they're as American as we are. Good evening, my name is Jim Murphy, Sergeant Jim Murphy. To, but to be fair, I've got to tell you that they're not just Americans. Some of them come from other countries. A few were looking for political freedom here, while others were just trying to improve their standard of living. So they left their homelands and settled down in New York, in the Port Authority building, in the streets, in the parks, wherever. Don't get me wrong, they love their newly adopted country and they're grateful for everything she does for them. Stage directions say he paces and talks. This is not to say that we haven't had our misunderstandings. These people have a weird sense of time. Like we think in years, but they think in hours. I'll give you a for instance. We sleep at night, right? Because that's normal. But they sleep during the day because they think it's safer. Shrugs, according to the stage directions. So a lot of times they don't even, they don't know what the hell's going on, even if they aren't nutcases. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I'd like to help those people, but you know it's hard to help. 
Those people have got to learn somehow to stand on their own two feet. They've got to learn to survive, to be enterprising. But when you help them all the time, for instance, when you give them food or money or clothes or vaccine, all you teach them is dependence. So obviously when you're helping them, you're, you're actually hurting them. I heard, that, uh, I heard that this is why begging is illegal in China, where they are not homeless. So obviously when you hurt them, it does mean that you're... Uh, so obviously when you're helping them, you're hurting them. But if you hurt them, it, it does not mean that you're always helping them. It's not that simple. Since you hurt them when you help them, and help them after you hurt them, it turns out that you can't help them when you're helping them either, and vice versa. Is that clear? I'll be back. So we open with this uh, speech by this police officer. Um, and uh, this play came out, this play premiered in uh, 1996. Um, and so this idea of charity, charity, especially governmental provided charity as a means of creating dependency as a sort of crutch for for the poor, the unfortunate, the unemployed, the homeless, whatever it is. This idea had a lot of currency in the 90s, uh, starting from the 80s with the Reagan revolution, really. So idea of like pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, which of course the vast, the overwhelming majority of actual data tells us is bullshit. But this was a, a an idea, a, a way of looking at the world that had a lot of currency in the, in the mid to late 90s. So we get this from the policeman. But again, we have this, the introduction of this idea that officially the homeless belong, officially immigrants belong as part of what it means to be Americans. But it's also pretty clear from this police officer's general attitude that they don't fully belong in his eyes. That even though he acknowledges on the, officially that the homeless are the same, that they're human beings, he doesn't really seem to believe it. So we've got that tension right from the beginning. And this comes up in other places. Because um, what we get in the play is... Um, so the, the sort of official primary conflict is that um, Anita's lover, Polly, has died and his body has been taken to be buried in a potter's field uh, on Hart Island. His body has been taken because to, to this sort of official city-run burial place because he doesn't have money for an actual funeral. And Anita doesn't want him buried there. She wants to get his body, bring it back to the park, and bury him in the park. Um, and she tries to get Sasha and Flea to do this, and, and eventually she does. They agree to do this, um, and they go get a body that may or may not be Polly's. It's it's difficult to tell because initially uh, Flea and Sasha identify the body as Polly's. Then they have doubts that it's his, but then Anita comes along and treats it as though it's Polly's body. So. We're not 100% clear whether whether or not this properly is Polly, um, although Glowacki does refer to him as Polly in the stage direction. But the question of belonging is really, really central. Um, and and Flea and Sasha and Anita all sort of have arguments about this question of belonging, um, accusing one another of not belonging at, at different points and things like this. Um, we get this played out uh, uh, fairly clearly when Anita learns that Polly has died and been taken to be buried in this potter's field. 
Um, she says, but why did they take him there? Sasha says, they had to take him somewhere. Anita says, but that place is only for criminals and bums with no names and, and rejects. Polly was a wasp. Are you a wasp? That, in case you don't know, uh, wasp, W-A-S-P, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Uh, Sasha says, no, a Russian. Anita says, Catholic or Protestant? Sasha says, no, a Jew. Anita says, well, then you're another story, but he was a wasp, so he belonged in America. It shouldn't be this way. So that, that's a really interesting idea here. He was a wasp, so he belonged in America. And again, this is coming from a Puerto Rican woman who has come, who has immigrated from Puerto Rico to the United States seeking economic opportunity. Um, but that idea of belonging or of not belonging uh, is really central to the play. And, and of course, Glowacki himself was an immigrant to the U.S. He came, uh, he came to Poland. He came from Poland. Sorry, uh, I think in the in the eighties, um, and moved to to New York, um, and and uh, became a, a sort of big shot in the in the art scene in New York, um, the Polish uh, community, Polish art scene in New York. So this idea of belonging in the United States, of, of being an immigrant, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, would be quite central to Glowacki's experience as well. There's some other elements here that I think are really interesting. Um, in the last scene, um, Act 2, Scene 10, we have the policeman who returns. Um, and we get a sort of reprisal of this idea in a in a different key. This idea that the homeless are proper human beings, which again the policeman seems somewhat on the fence about. Um, so in the last scene, he says, during a clean sweep police action like the one taken in the park last week, we decide to eliminate phase one and phase two and go directly to phase three and clean the park. Earlier in the play, he had talked about phase one as a sort of, as a police technique wherein you ask someone to stop, uh, for instance, smoking in the Port Authority building or sleeping on a park bench or something like that. Um, in phase two, you give them a warning, and then in phase three, you detain them or beat them or arrest them or whatever it is. Uh, there was a lot of gossip afterwards that some homeless guy had been buried there, but it wasn't there. We dug up half the park and didn't find anything. Then it turns out that the source of the gossip was a crazy, crazy Puerto Rican woman who used to live there. The woman kept trying to get back in even after we put up a ten-foot-high cyclone fence. Finally, she hung herself off the main gate. She was taken to Potter's Field. Well, what can you do? Some people are beyond help. In the stage direction, so he notices Sasha's tape recorder lying on the ground, picks it up, fiddles it with it, and shakes it a couple of times. Just one more thing I thought you might be interested in. Current statistics now say that the number of homeless in New York is growing, and that by the end of this year, for every 300 New Yorkers, there will be one homeless person, which means that in this theater tonight, there's at least one prospective homeless person, and you know who you are. Have a nice evening. So that's a really interesting end bit. There's a couple of things that are important here. One is the sort of meta-theatrical breaking of the fourth wall, that, which the police officer does periodically throughout. He, he engages with the audience. But that idea that one person in the audience... Uh, da, da, da. In this theater tonight, there is at least one prospective homeless person. This idea that at least one person in the audience will be homeless within the year is a really interesting one. And the idea that that person knows who they are is further interesting because that suggests, and this is a very common attitude, although often incorrect, about homelessness, that homelessness is predictable. Whereas in reality, a lot of times homelessness is not 
necessarily predictable. You lose your job, you have an unexpected expense or something like this, a medical condition, something like this, um, an accident, something like this, and you and you can't financially recover. So this idea that you know who you are, the person who's going to become homeless, this plays into, again, this very sort of 1990s, 1980s mentality that homelessness is a moral failing and that people could avoid it if they just were better. Which again, uh, is not really supported by uh, the data, is not really supported by the experience of actual homeless people. Um, so it's an interesting element to it. Um, another thing that we get here is just a very casual mention of Anita's suicide. Uh, that she she hung herself off the main gate of this enclosure after they they locked down the park. The fact that this is just mentioned in passing and elicits almost no real reaction from the police officer is very very interesting, because again it suggests to us that he's maybe not really accepting his premise that homeless people are actual human beings. Um, the other thing that's potentially interesting, um, we do actually have a scene, Act 2, Scene 8, in which Anita is raped. Um, she gets raped off stage, but we hear it and we hear her cries for help. Um, Sasha tries to go to her help, but he's having some sort of medical issue, some sort of physical attack at the time that prevents him. Uh, Flea does not attempt to go help Anita. Uh, he is not really her friend, and so he sits by while this happens. And so that's a striking contrast, because scene nine is a very short scene. Act 2, Scene 9. So we get Anita being raped. Then in Act 2, Scene 9, essentially all that happens is that she comes on stage, having been raped, sits on the park bench, and all three of these characters, Sasha, Flea, and Anita, are sort of... their spirits are crushed, essentially. And the scene ends with the flashing police lights, and then we go into scene 10, where this police officer explains that they went in and arrested everyone. We can infer from this that the police made no attempt to deal with Anita's rape. That there was no, whether or not she even reported it to them, we don't know, but clearly it was not top of their priorities list to make sure that, that this crime was ever going to be solved. And so the fact that we go from her being raped to her being in police custody uh, and clearly having talked to the police because uh, there's no other way that the police would have known that Polly was buried in the park, but they clearly have no interest in investigating her rape. And so again, we have this question. Does Anita belong in America? Because she's homeless, because she's an immigrant, does she matter in America? And I, I think Gloacki is, is pressing us to ask that very difficult question. 